of knowledge. There's the Greek word oida, and that word oida is kind of the understanding of a, of a conscious knowledge of something. It's the idea of the mind, right? That, that I've, I, I've, I've gained this knowledge, and it's not necessarily something that I, I learned in the classroom. The other Greek word that is used is the word gnosko, and it's more of the experiential knowledge. And obviously that's the word that is used for what we call an agnostic. An agnostic is, is formed by the, the prefix a, a, and then gnosis, or what we use the word gnosis here, and it's the idea of no knowledge. And, and therefore when you put it with God, it's a, an agnostic is somebody who said you can't know God. It's impossible to know God. He's too far out there. And they're not an atheist that they reject that there's no God. It's that you can't know this God. And certainly Paul would write to or Paul would speak to the philosophers on Mars Hill there in Athens and he would declare to them this unknown God. Let me tell you, you can't know this God. Matter of fact, he wants us to know him. One of the most profound thoughts that I've ever had regarding this matter of God is kind of a two-sided coin. And it's first of all that I can know God. And God desires me to know Him. The Apostle Paul would remind us of that, that I may know Him, the power of His resurrection. But not only the fact that I get to know God, but perhaps maybe more precious is that He knows me. He knows me inside and out. He knows my up rising. He knows my down sitting. He knows my highs, my lows. He knows every ebb and flow of my being. What a wonderful truth that is. We come here to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and when Paul writes this, that he may abound in everything in faith, in utterance, and knowledge, he uses the word gnosko. I want you to abound in this experiential knowledge, this objective knowledge, the, the, the fact that, that you can know certain things, whether it be the general knowledge of the Christian faith or a deeper, more perfected knowledge in some of the deeper things of, of God. And Paul would kind of use the analogy that, that there are times that, that uh, believers are on different spiritual planes or spiritual levels, right? There, there are babes in Christ and you can grow up. Matter of fact, Peter would remind us of that in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. God desires us to, to grow and to, to get deeper with Him. We certainly know or can know what is right versus what is wrong. And so knowledge is, is not just the apprehension in the mind, the intellect there, but it's also what we can experience, what, what we can know. I love how the scriptures use the, the analogy of the marital relationship. Adam knew his wife. Right? It, it's not speaking about the fact that, that Adam got to know what she likes, what she doesn't like. It's not the fact that, that Adam came to the place and said, you know what, I, I, like she, I know that she likes roses more than she likes tulips. I know that she likes dark chocolate more than milk chocolate or white chocolate. I don't know how anyone can like dark chocolate. Pastor Nick loves it and he offers it to me all the time. Here he was. No, I don't like dark chocolate. And then, of course, he has it here. It's got nuts because he knows nuts will kill me. So, uh, <laughs> no, it really won't. But, uh, you know, but that, that's not the, the understanding of, of knowledge here when Adam knew his wife. It's speaking about the experiential relationship, the physical, intimate relationship with her. What a wonderful truth 
that is for us to gather regarding this matter of, of knowledge. And so when we look at this, we, we realize that, that God has, has so many things to say about this, this matter of, of knowledge. Whether it be the, the intellectual aspect or the experiential aspect. Certainly the highest knowledge possible to man is knowing God. Knowing what he says, turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Verse 19 says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. You know, there's an intellectual side that people have built in them to know God. It's impossible for anybody to be an agnostic in all reality. Right? Because God says, no, I, I've, I've manifested this to them. You say, who's he speaking to? He's speaking to Christians, right? No, no, no. This is before they're Christians. Right? And we would say that that there's an intellectual side of, of knowing God, but then there's the experiential side of knowing God. That I've entered into a personal relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so in verse 19, He says, For God has shown it unto Him, for the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that... When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was dark, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man, birds, and a four-footed beast, and creeping things, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, and you see that that's because they rejected this intellectual knowledge, this conscious knowledge of God. God wants to be known. But obviously, that takes a little different understanding. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says in verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Right? And so there's this lack of knowledge. And so God desires for us to, to know certain things. The important thing, obviously, is having the knowledge of God and understanding that knowledge. So let's look at several things that God desires. For us to know. Three things just real simply. Number one. God desires for us to have a knowledge. Of his word. A knowledge of God's word. Psalm 119. Such a profound psalm. Just I mean when you. You study the psalm. Psalm 19. This. Psalm in its entirety and go through it, uh, it is just, it is an intellectual exercise in, in the sense that, that there's so many things, right? I mean, because you, you look at, at Psalm 119 in its literary structure, it takes the form of the Hebrew alphabet, which are 22 letters, and it hits every single alphabet of the, of the, of the Hebrew Bible, or of the Hebrew alphabet, I should say. And, uh, and within that, then you hear these different nuances regarding the Word of God. Just looking at verse number 1, it says, The law of the Lord, verse 2, testimonies. Verse 3, His ways. Verse 4, His precepts. Verse 5, His statutes. Verse 6, His commandments. Verse 7, His judgments. So here you have all different nuances of the Word of God. But we see here in Psalm 119, 105, that God says, Thy word 
is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God says, I want you to know my word. I want you to gain a knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Well, obviously both. An intellectual knowledge we ought to have, but an experiential knowledge. We know God's word. And our hearts can identify with the truths of the word of God. Turn over to Acts chapter 4. We see this in action. In Acts chapter 4. Verse number 23, and being let go, this is Peter and John, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and others had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth, against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, O Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, they, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke or spake the word of God with boldness. What was the, the desire? Do you know the word of God? Let me ask, is that our desire? That people would know the Word of God. I mean, there's there's almost a, a sense where, where people, you know, especially unsafe people, they, they don't want to know the Word. Right? They don't want to know truth. They don't, they don't want you to, to share with them that aspect. And, and does that, or should that stop us? And the answer is, of course, not. You know, we, we ought to be praying that God would open their eyes so that they might know truth and therefore be set free by that truth. But but what about other believers? Right? I mean, we, we ought to desire to know the Word of God. I just want to know your Word. I want to know the precepts. I want to know the statutes. I want to know the judgments. I want to know these things. I want to know what your Word says. And so therefore, I have this hunger, this thirst, the Word of God. God, I want, I want to know you. How do you get to know God? By knowing His Word. And so God desires that we have a knowledge of His Word. Outside of the Scriptures, that there's no possible way that we can come to the knowledge of the truth. Paul would write to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, which Obviously, Timothy as a, as a preacher, right, as a shepherd of the flock of God who is to feed the flock of God, Paul charges him in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And he says this, that these are people in the last days, the verse number 1, that are ever learning in verse 7 and, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You realize that, that there are people that can be ever learning I mean, they can have a Ph.D. upon a Ph.D. upon a Ph.D. with a Th.D. as well. And what? Never come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? What is truth? Thy word is truth. So there ought to be a knowledge that we have of God's word. Secondly, from that knowledge of God's word, then we can have a knowledge of God's ways. A knowledge of God's ways. Why? We, we understand this. We know this. That God's ways are not our ways. Right? His, His ways are far higher, far greater, far bigger, far deeper than our ways. Right? I mean, you start trying to think 
through things and try to figure things out. You're like, man, God, I don't know that I would have done it that way. I mean, I, just in all honesty, I don't know that if I were the creator of the universe that I would redeem men and women who rejected me. I'd say, fine, you, you want to be that way? Go, go right ahead, you idiot. Right? I mean, that, that, that's what they are. They're fools. Right? And, and uh, you know, God's ways are not my ways. But does that mean that God does not want us to know His ways? And of course He does. Well, how are we going to get to know His ways? By knowing His Word. That's why it's so important for us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. Turn with me to Psalm 103. Just going to kind of cut out a few verses here. Psalm 103. Verse number 7. He had made known his ways unto Moses. And his acts unto the children of Israel. Listen, if God made his ways known to Moses, then don't you think that he wants to make his ways known to us? Of course, Psalm 128. 128 and verse number 1. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, and that walketh in his ways. Right? God wants us to know His ways. The Scriptures remind us, back in Proverbs, or over in Proverbs chapter 8, in verse number 20, 2 Peter chapter 2, in verse number 21, He wants us to know the way of righteousness. He wants us to know the way of godliness. He wants us to know the way of holiness. He wants us to know those ways. This is the way to be righteous. It's the way to be holy. It's the way to be pure. What's the way? Just keeping His commandments and doing certain things? No. It's by knowing Jesus Christ. Right? He is our righteousness. But God wants us to know the practical aspects of that. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul reminds Timothy He says, verse number four, that God would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because it's through the truth that men get to know the way of righteousness, where Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. God desires that we increase in knowledge. Ephesians chapter 4, and verse number 13. Paul says this. Ephesians 4, verse 13. Till we all come, speaking of the responsibility of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. God wants us to know the way of the, the Son of God. He wants us, according to 2 Peter chapter 1, to add to our faith. And one of those things that we add is to add knowledge so that we know His ways. <clears throat> we certainly are to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. And so, God wants us to know His, his Word. In knowing His Word, we'll know His ways. And then thirdly, God wants us to know His will. That we would have a knowledge of God's will. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. Paul writes in verse 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And listen, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. 
that ye might walk worthy of the Lord and do all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So I want you to know my will. <clears throat> I want you to know my will. What is God's will? You know, sometimes I, I several weeks ago, Pastor Nick's or the first week he was away on vacation, he asked me to teach the teens, and so I had to, the class there, and I, I taught on the will of God. And oftentimes, here's what we think, or here's how we think the will of God. We think the will of God is something we find. We've got to find the will of God. We've got to find it. It's, it's, it's there somewhere. And if I can just find God's will, then man, everything will be good. I need to find God's will regarding a wife. I've got to find God's will regarding a, a husband. I've got to find God's will regarding a job. I've got to find God's will regarding uh, a, a career. I've got to find God's will regarding the house. I've got to find God's will regarding the, the car and all those things. And, and, and is God interested in, in those things? And the answer is, of course he is. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. He will guide us in those things. But... We have to understand God's will is not something we find. It's something we do. <coughs> you say, well, how can I do God's will if I don't know it? Uh -huh. By what? Knowing His word. You say, what is God's will? Just real quickly, let me point out. I love Romans chapter 12. How Carlton verse, and, and uh, perhaps a, a life verse for some of you. Romans chapter 12, if I was allowed to have more than one life verse, this might be it. But I'm only allowed to have one. So, <laughs> just kidding. If you're like, is that God's will? No, no, no. God's will is not that you have only one life verse, okay? You can have more than that. But Romans chapter 12, verse number 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. By the way, that's part of the will of God. Uh, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. He doesn't say that you may find that perfect will of God. Right? But, but this is what you do. You, you do... God's will. And what is God's will? First of all, it's God's will to be saved. God is not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. It is God's will for people to be saved. So, so if I want to know God's will for my life, if you will, if, if, if that's kind of part of my life, then you know what? I ought to be actively doing God's will. And you say, well, I'm already saved. No, no, no. God's not willing that any perish. So that means if you're saved, then it is God's will for you to go after somebody else. Sharing the gospel is the will of God for your life. And I remember having teens who would come to me and they'd say, Pastor Norman, I, I really want to know God's will for my life. I want to know, uh, uh, you know where to go to college and different things. And what is God's will for that? And I would start with them and I'd say, okay, let's just go through. What, it, what do we already know is God's will? And, and therefore, are you doing it? One of those, are you saved? Well, yeah, I'm saved. Okay, great. Are you sharing it with others? Hmm? That's your job, Pastor. It's not my job. That's all of ours. Right? And so, so it's God's will for people to be saved. It's God's will for His children to serve. You know, this is your reasonable service. Right? And, and we can go through other passages first. Uh, Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Romans 15, and, and there's so, so many different passages that, that God says, it is my will that you serve. And so, yes, I'm saved and I'm serving. It is God's will that we abstain from fornication, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, that we know how to handle our bodies. It is God's will, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, to give thanks. Remember we read earlier from 2 Timothy where Paul is writing to Timothy and saying, you know what, in the last days or in perilous times, right, part of those perilous times, part of those dangerous 
days or what, people are unthankful. You know, it's God's will for us to give thanks. It is God's will for us to give thanks. Not for all things, but in all things. It's God's will for us to give thanks in everything. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. God, but I, I don't like that. Give thanks. You know, there's always something to give thanks about. Even through the bad, even through the hardship, even through the trial, even through the dark, God is so good to us. And all we need to do is, is give thanks. Out of all I have to give thanks for is my salvation. That's enough. <clears throat> right? So it's God's will for us to give thanks. It's God's will for us to put to silence ignorance. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. And so, when you think of that, okay, so what? We're talking about this knowledge of God's Word, right? A knowledge of God's ways and a knowledge of God's will. And then, then what does he say? You know, put to silence ignorance. That, that's my will. Well, how am I going to put that to silence? By getting into the Word. You see, the, in essence, it all comes back to the Word of God. How important that is in our lives. It's God's will that we suffer. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19. And that as, in essence, what Peter says that you count it joyful. That you get to suffer for Christ. Now, none of us want that. I don't want to suffer. You know, you mean, Pastor, you're telling me that, that if, if I get saved, it's God's will for me to suffer? Yeah. You know, one of the things that's, that's mind-boggling to me is I, I love the book of Acts. just love, love the book of Acts. And it's persecution after persecution after persecution after persecution after persecution. But you know what? If the persecution didn't take place, then here's the question. Would the gospel have gone to the uttermost parts of the world? You see, in the midst of their persecution... They were what? Fulfilling the great commission. And so it is God's will that even sometimes, and some people, not necessarily all people, suffer for his name. Say, 1 John chapter 2 tells us it's God's will that we love not the world, neither the things of it. It's God's will. <clears throat> you know, so some people say, you know, I gotta, I gotta find God's will out there. No, just do God's will. And what will happen? God will lead you along life's journey. God will direct your path. He delights to do that. What a blessing it is for us to know that truth. And so when we look at this, Paul writes, and Paul says, yeah, I want you to abound in everything. I want you to abound in knowledge. Wouldn't it be great if you and I were just oozing out God's word. That, that we were oozing out God's ways. And we were just oozing out God's will. And people would look at us and they'd say, Well, man, you really know your God, don't you? And I want to get to know him better. I don't want to get to know him deeper. I want to get to know him. Paul's prayer was that in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him. All that we would know him. As we close, I want us to just consider this final thought. 1 Corinthians, I want to close with 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Just read here. Verses 1 and 2, where Paul says, Now as touching things offered unto idols. And I'm not talking about the matter of idols here. But he says this, We know, and that word know there is oida, that we all have, we can know skill. 
We all have knowledge. Knowledge puff it up. Charity edify. And if any man think that he knoweth, gnosko, anything, he gnosko nothing yet as he ought to oika. You say, what in the world is he saying here? In essence, what he's saying is this simply, knowledge itself will puff up. It'll puff me up. It'll make me have a big head. You think of some of these brilliant people in the world that do not know God. Right? We just heard of one just recently passing away. Stephen Paul. Brilliant guy. Who says you can't know God. Or perhaps he said there is no God. I'll guarantee he knows it now. It's sadly so. Knowledge itself will puff up, but when it is mixed with God's word, God's ways, and God's will, it will lead to blessing. God wants to bless us abundantly, richly. How are we going to get in on those blessings? This knowledge. That we're to abound in, we're to overflow. Super abundance of this knowledge through his word, his ways, and his will. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for time tonight to get into the word of God. Lord, what a blessing, what a joy it is to know the truth. Jesus would teach us that. We're to be sanctified by truth, and thy word is truth. I pray, God, that you help us, Lord, to grow in our knowledge of your word. God, that it wouldn't just be uh, an exercise of duty and responsibility. God, that it would truly be a time for we know what it says, both intellectually as well as experientially. God, I pray that as we know your word, that we would then know your ways, the ways of righteousness and holiness, and truth and purity, that we might walk in them and obey. God, that that would lead us to knowing your will. That we would faithfully observe what you have given us. God, again, we thank you, Lord, for this knowledge that you give us, the knowledge that you desire for us to abound in. You. Lord, it's not about the academics, it's not about the degrees that we can gain and earn in this earthly life. Or if all those things were just simply what our goal in life was, how sad. That, Lord, you desire for us to know you. And I pray that we will grow in that knowledge. So Lord, help us. We'll thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to close.